Welcome uh, to the um, Iron Seminar for 2023 Spring Semester. So today we are glad to have uh, Dr. Veronica Santos, and she will give a talk about getting in touch tactile perception for human robot system. So I want to give a brief introduction to uh, Dr. Santos. She is a professor at the uh, Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and she is a director of the UCLA Biomechatronics Lab. She served, she served as Associate Dean for Equity Diversity and Inclusion and Artifact Affairs for UCLA School of Engineering. She earned the uh, master, uh, Bachelor Degree from UC Berkeley and with a minor in music, uh, music, which is very, very unique. And she did a PhD in Cornell. And uh, she first uh, took a, a, a postdoc training at the uh, University of South California. California, and then she came to Arizona State as assistant professor. She received a lot of awards, including the NSF Career Award, US, uh, US Defense Science Study Group, and US the National Academy of Engineering Frontiers of Engineering Education Sym Symposium, and many teaching awards from Arizona and also um, LA. So she has been you know, served as several um, communities and also um, uh, uh, editor of the IEEE uh, Haptics Symposium and also editor-in-chief of several journals. So now with that, so let's welcome Dr. Santos. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, the weather is great compared to the flooding that's going on in California, so it's nice to be able to walk around here without an umbrella. Um, but it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you. Feel free to interrupt me at any time uh, with, with questions, and there will be time for questions at the end as well. But I direct the Biomechatronics Lab at UCLA, and our mission is to improve quality of life and quality of work by enhancing the functionality of artificial grippers. And in human-machine systems, we do that primarily by thinking about touch. Touch for prosthetic hands, touch for artificial hands, and um, you know, before I dig into my talk, I just want to put a plug in for uh, the fact that our School of Engineering, all departments are hiring if, that, if you're at that stage of your educational career. Um, and also tell you about uh, this 10,000 square foot collaborative robotics space that we're building that will have uh, six robotics PIs from three different departments, a lot of complementary type of robotics, and a third of that space is, is for communal use for anyone in our School of Engineering that is interested in robotics. So this is really exciting. Um, we're, we're just getting started on the construction of this space. Uh, but this is uh, just a, a little teaser of things that our lab works on uh, from the human side that I won't get to talk to you about today, but maybe over lunch or, or after this talk we can connect. But uh, we have studied uh, responses to unexpected perturbations, looked at multi-digit coordination, looked at things that uh, are seamless for humans, like object handover, but still difficult for human robot uh, handovers. More recently, we've done some eye tracking to infer intent, human intent, during activities of daily living and using eyes as, as a kind of a guide for where we think the hands are going to go to prepare. Uh, for robots that will interact with robots for assistive activities of daily living. And we've also done some work, work on human search and retrieval as a precursor to some of the robotic work on haptic search and retrieval that I'll tell you about a little later. Uh, but I wanted to kind of begin and end this talk with some videos that you might be, uh, find interesting and kind of, um, you know, to kind of reflect where I began my career and how I've circled back to it. I started out in, in neuroprosthetics, specifically upper limb neuroprosthetics and artificial hands, and um, had to move away from that for various funding reasons. And now I found a way to get back to it. Uh, so I would argue that you know you can you've seen a lot of hands that can do um, very cool things, fast things, dexterous things. They don't necessarily have to look like human hands, um, but we're interested in tasks that humans are interested in. Uh, and, and I would argue that uh, movement without touch is limiting in that you're missing out on all those rich finger object interactions and the improved planning and control that you could do if you had uh, complementary uh, modes of sensing, such as touch. So I'm going to start with this video. Um, it's a PBS NewsHour segment from 2015, and then we'll come back. But um, I'm currently collaborating with Dustin Tyler's lab at Case Western Reserve University, and he's featured here.
So when I think about the, the importance and potential use of touch in human robot systems, I think about human robot systems as this continuum. And so I'm going to have little slides like this with just very pithy thoughts about how we think about touch. So the first one is that touch is useful. And if you think about the continuum of human robot systems, you can have robots inside the body, robots on the body, robots working in close proximity to the body, whether it's for activities of daily living or uh, co-manufacturing. But then there are going to be some scenarios where you don't want to put humans in harm's way. So you start moving that robot that used to be connected or inside the body farther and farther away for extreme environments, search and rescue, uh, handling of dangerous materials. Maybe there are buried objects that might explode. Maybe you're doing nuclear decommissioning or you are working in very extreme underwater environments where human scuba diving is, is not really a possibility, um, or you know, preparing for um, living in space. So there's this whole continuum in each of these different problems uh, spaces have different needs. And uh, that's why you'll see a little bit later, I don't believe that there's any one tactile sensor to rule them all. It really begins with your application and the environment and other constraints um, that, that go along with that. Um, and I like to say that, that you know, vision is great. We use vision when we can for planning. There are some things that vision cannot tell you, which can only be gleaned through proprioceptive means or through direct uh, contact that are not easily visible. And so when you don't have a direct line of sight or your hand occludes the object, you're working in the dark, behind obstacles, inside your pocket, right? You can find the power button on your cell phone without looking. Um, maybe in extreme environments, in smoke, in turbid water, um, that there are gonna be times when you don't have vision and having a complementary sense of touch would be very useful for um, you know, maintaining um, system stability. I also threw in here some uh, very challenging types of objects, and these are deformable. So deformable linear objects like rope, deformable shells or, or sheets um, like uh, bills or pages of a book, or deformable bulk materials for which we don't, do not currently have um, analytical models of how these deformable objects might work or might uh, deform in response to contact. We have the visual outcome of that, but that's where also having tactile sensation when you don't have a line of sight would be useful. And then I threw in, what if you're working with something that is not only uh, bulk, bulky, deformable, but also animate, and it's doing things that you are not going to predict? And then I had to throw in in-hand manipulation because this still remains a grand challenge for robotics, and um, I believe that touch is important for that as well. So all of these things, many of which happen in our day-to-day -day lives, we take touch for granted. Um, so second little remark is that touch is multifaceted. Right? It's very complex. It has lots of different features that you could leverage if, it, if you find it useful. And um, you know, there are debates about this, but if you want to take a classical textbook-based approach to looking at the biological me mechanoreceptors in the fingertip, there are four types. And you would split them into the superficial, very close to the surface of the skin. Those are the type one. Then you have the type two, which is a little deeper down in the tissue. And within each of those two spatial locations, you have the fast adapting, uh, FA1, FA2, these are the mechanoreceptors that respond to changes and transients um, in contrast to the SA1, which are more the slow, static. And we get a lot of um, bang for our buck in, in our robot experiments by focusing on those SA type sensors because a lot of the tasks that we're interested in rely on information about local finger pad deformation, and it's the SA1, SA2 that tell you about that. But there are obviously other tasks maybe you want to haptically explore a texture, that's where the vibration sensing the FA2 could be really useful. So again, it goes back to your, your application and your environment. But I would argue that everything that we've done, uh, aside from trying to grow new human fingertips, is kind of the engineering kludgy workaround to, to recreate things that uh, biology has already made beautiful for us. I'm not saying that everything needs to be biomimetic, but it surely, sure is inspirational to see that this already exists. And are there principles that we can try and recreate as engineers? That's the, the fun part. Um, so here's the part where I say we are agnostic to the type of tactile sensor that we use. 
Uh, we will use the sensor that encodes the actionable information that we're interested in so that either a human operator or the robot itself can make a decision. As long as that sensor encodes that information and we can decode that to make our decision, that's what we care about. So we worked with all sorts of different types of tactile sensors. I'm starting off here with the low cost ones that are good entry points for people. And actually, Charlie Kemp sitting up here helped us. This paper would not have been possible without Charlie because at the time, no one had this Pietzer resistive fabric. But Charlie and his doctoral student at the time, Dr. Tapu Bhattacharya, had this. They sent us some scraps, and we put together the sensor, and, and a collaborative paper came out of it. So, so thank you. Oh, did he? OK, Mark Kilbeck, yeah. So a lot of connections here. Uh, but the point is that if you want to do something low cost, maybe not super high resolution, but covers large areas, which is something that I think that our field needs to think more about, um, you can embed pietro resistive fabrics in these wrappable uh, things. Uh, another approach is to take the barometers and leveraging all the advances that have come about from the, the scale and uh, you know, worldwide availability of cell phones take a barometer from one of those cell phones embedded in elastomer. That idea came from uh, Rob Wood's lab. Uh, no, I take it back. Rob Howe's lab, I'm sorry. Rob Howe at, at Harvard. And um, Matej Chokarli has put, uh, he's at Columbia, has put a spin on it where instead of having this flat array of barometers embedded in elastomer, you can tilt some out of the plane. And now you can um, put them in whatever form factor you care about. And using machine learning for pattern recognition, in theory, back out a 3D force vector. So these are very low cost things that you could do without specialized equipment in your lab. Uh, they're better than nothing. They're not super high resolution, but depending again on your research question, they could be just right for what you need and uh, budget wise just right as well. Um, Going a little more advanced, I have a collaboration for more than a decade now with Jonathan Posner. We started off as next door office neighbors at Arizona State. He went off to University of Washington. I went to UCLA, and we've continued this collaboration. But this is the very first tactile sensor we ever made with microscale channels in a PDMS, very soft, stretchable elastomer. And you fill the microfluidic channels with a liquid metal. And you use that liquid metal channel as a fluidic wire. So it's, you can stretch it, twist it, bend it. It won't fatigue. Um, the dirty little secret that all microfluidics people know about is that the connection from the liquid wire to the rigid wire is the most vulnerable part. And no one has figured that out yet. So if, if this thing has a problem, it's because the wires will pull out at that transition point. But this is a capacitive-based approach where it looks like these wires are intersecting with one another, but they're actually, if you look at this cross-sectional view, passing over one another. And where they pass over one another, they create a little capacitive taxel, which is the tactile analog to a pixel. So each of these little units, you know, five by five grid of taxels that only sense normal force. Because as a capacitor, it's only going to sense really the force that brings these two wires together. We then transition to a resistive-based approach. So now imagine that you have um, strain gauges, but they are fluidic and they're tiny. So this serpentine design is just a liquid metal strain gauge that we have put on different sides of this nail bed here. And the reason we did that is that um, if you take your own finger, Press it on the table, put your sandwiches down, put your finger on the table, and kind of shift your finger left, right. If you think about where the strain is that you're feeling, it's where your skin is attaching to your fingernail. And so you can put these types of strain gauges near the nail bed to measure shear while leaving all of this other area open for your normal force taxels. And so that idea came about through some work with a sensor I'll show you about in a minute called the Biotac, where we realized that um, you can also leverage deformation information from the whole finger pad, even in areas that are not directly contacting the object of interest. So that's why we put a pair of these on either side to infer uh, shear this way. And then if you put a pair running this way, see so that's the y direction, we put another pair here for the x direction, now you have 2D shear. And then you put in this open area where you think there's going to be direct contact, now we transition to these isotropically designed spiral strain gauges for normal force sensing. And now we have uh, 3D force, but the coolest thing we found was by transitioning from the capacitive to the resistive approach, 
we didn't have that capacitive like, recharge delay. So we can actually measure vibrations up to 800 hertz with this, vibration, or with this resistive approach. Um, and most recently, we have taken that design and marinized it for use underwater. We had to create this whole new setup that we never had before to test them underwater under pressure. So imagine going you know, hundreds of meters uh, underwater and the, uh, making sure that not only will this not leak, but will it still be sensitive under uh, very high PSI ranges. And so um, again, I think we have a lot of work to go. We have uh, another two years coming to further uh, make this robust. But uh, this is, you know, to my knowledge, one of the first types of multimodal tactile sensors that can be used underwater under pressure for things that the Navy cares about, for example, like instead of sending a human scuba diver to blindly feel on the holes of ships for mines or around pier pilings, you could have a remotely operated uh, robot with touch, either making some semi-autonomous decisions or sending some of that information back to the warfighter to make their own uh, high-level decision. But underwater tactile sensing is pretty exciting. Uh, we're just getting started on making the devices, but there's still a lot of research to be done because if you think about how tactile sensors work, unless you're thinking about thermal stimuli or chemical stimuli, um, it requires a mechanical deformation. So if you don't have the right frictional properties, then that deformation energy does not go into your sensor and you don't sense anything. So testing these underwater, figuring out the threshold for grip forces where you still get some grasp in, in oily conditions or whatever, um, that all that work remains to be done. Um, many of you are probably familiar with camera-based approaches to tactile sensing. This is fairly new, but um, it has really um, allowed for an explosion uh, in the tactile sensor area because computer vision people can take all of their algorithms and directly apply them to a different type of data, which opens up all these other um, applications. And so we have a collaboration with Ted Adelson at MIT whose team created the gel site. And we've got a variety of gel site evolutions, but what you're seeing here is one of the older versions that's a little bulkier than what you can get now. But the key is to have an elastomeric finger pad um, their secret sauce is some uh, highly reflective material on the inside. You base, you put a camera from the inside, so imagine you're inside the finger looking out at the world. And um, you can even enhance your tactile images by putting dots, so some dots are shown here. And by applying known stimuli, um, you know, 3D forces and torques and measuring the visual change in that array, you can map geometry, um, local shape, forces, torques. And so uh, this little video is showing the, you know, what it looks like when you press this gel site against cables that are also uh, partially buried in granular media. So that idea, um, you know, other people, including Facebook, now Meta, have created the digit. This started out as an open source recipe. So if you want to build your own, the recipe is out there. Um, but uh, you can also, they have now a partnership with gel sites. You can buy gel site minis, and they're very affordable. So if you're interested in that, that is a nice pathway to entering into this computer vision based uh, tactile sensing approach. Uh, the sensor you're going to see the most in this talk is the Biotech, and that's only because I worked on it when I was a postdoc way back when. It was funded by DARPA for their revolutionizing prosthetics program. It was meant to be put on prosthetic hands, which is why it's, it's bio-inspired. It has a rigid core like the bone in your finger, an elastomeric skin that's inflated away from the core by conductive fluid. And um, we use primarily this array of electrodes. I'll show you uh, the sensor without the skin a little bit later. But if you look at the spatial temporal changes in electrode impedance, you can infer the overall finger pad deformation. And if you uh, tap into this fluid volume and put an off-the-shelf pressure sensor, now you have a hydrophone that you can sample slowly to get a very crude measurement of overall fingertip force. Or uh, at up to 2,200 hertz of sampling rate, you could infer um, vibrations and in estimate the properties, you know, the texture of an object that you're interacting with, because this skin actually has a fingerprint on it to amplify the vibrations. And if you use it too much, the fingerprint wears out. It's, a, it's meant to be a consumable. Um, but so you've got vibration, finger pad deformation, overall fingertip force. There's also a thermistor in here. 
And if you measure the rate of heat conduction away from the finger, you can infer material properties. And what um, my lab primarily does is, is look at the finger pad deformation. We collect all of the data. We do ablation studies on the back end. And we find that most of the things that we have cared about recently just trace back to local finger pad uh, deformation. Oh, I should make a disclosure that I, I'm still involved with uh, Syntouch on their board of advisors. Um, all right, so I've shown you this array, the smorgasbord of different tactile sensor types. And these are just devices that are going to take mechanical stimuli and turn them into digital stimuli that you can measure. But it really doesn't take you all the way to features of interest that humans care about. Right? So um, the next point is that touch is abstraction. Right? So haptic perception, perception which I distinguish from sensing, to me sensing is just having a device collecting some stream of numbers, but the perception is abstracting those stream of numbers to something meaningful, like texture, hardness, temperature, weight. So if I asked you what is the roughness of the chair that you're sitting on, imagine what you would do. Probably rub your finger across the chair to infer um, the texture properties. And that's exactly what Liederman and Klatsky found in this classical 1987 paper, where they had participants come in, gave them a bunch of objects, and asked them to describe the objects, and then observed what these exploratory procedures or exploratory movements um, that were made by the participants. And there are very classical, specific movements that you make when you're trying to estimate specific properties. So if it's hardness, you squeeze the object. If it's temperature, you usually have a static contact, rubbing for texture, uh, using the whole hand for global shape, but actually following the contour with your finger for, for local shape. And all we did was replay those uh, exploratory movements on a robot with the biotech sensors. This was done about eight years ago. Um, but we did work on edge orientation of edges of different thicknesses, edges at different orientations relative to the body, because we thought that that would be the precursor to the next level of decision making, like for contour following. Uh, we also did. Um, bumps and pits of different sizes and shapes, some that were flat, pyramidal, hemispherical, different shapes or sizes relative to the finger. And what you see in this little inset is how the electrodes are changing what the impedance is uh, for these different electrode regions on the fingertip as the um, exploratory movement happens. Right? And then back then, we were using support vector Class, uh, support vector machines for classification and support vector regression. We use uh, convolutional neural networks these days, but um, that, that's the approach we took back then. Uh, so more recently, we've done tactile perception of directionality. So if you're holding an object like your water bottle in front of you and you set it down, and there's that relative motion of the object within your grasp as the object contacts the table, we want to be able to measure that directionality uh, because you know you can do that with your eyes closed. So um, what we did was we flipped it when we collect, collected data. Instead of perturbing the object relative to the fingertip, we perturbed the fingertip relative to the object and just collected uh, thousands of trials. And you can visually see here the finger pad deforming. But we're collecting all the information, especially the impedance electrode data from the biotech. And then what we did was, uh, here's the, uh, the sensor without the skin. Uh, we basically took these 19 electrodes, mapped them onto this manifold. We interpolated between them, assuming that they're all bathed in the same continuous uh, bladder of fluid and interpolate between them to create this manifold. And when there is a positive change in electrode impedance relative to the baseline contact, um, that tells us that the skin is getting compressed toward the core of the finger. And if we see a negative change relative to that baseline, the skin is bulging away from the container or, or um, bulging away from the core of the finger. And then if you have this manifold, you can map it to grayscale or color just to get this quote unquote tactile image and then apply traditional uh, convolutional neural network approaches. So um, I remember talking to Ted Adelson when we were doing some of this work. And he said, if you as a human can visually see the differences and, and categorize them in your head, pretty much guarantee a neural network can do that for you. So we, we used convolutional neural networks to distinguish between these. We actually did it for um, 
thousands of random angles within this 360 degrees, um, but I'm just showing you the, the key um, orthogonal versions so you can compare them. And once you've uh, learned that, then in real time, you can use this train model to infer tactile direction. So what you're going to see in this upper left image is a little video with a line. And that line is going to show you on this 360 degree pie what the robot thinks is the direction that the object is moving relative to the fingertips. The first example is a handover. And um, Dr. Gutierrez programmed it so that the robot would only release the object when it felt like the object was being pulled away from the palm, which is out in this direction. So if you have this ability, then you can design in context appropriate responses from the robot when they're interacting with an object or interacting with the environment in this case. So when you get that relative upward motion, the object you're grasping is probably coming into contact with the support surface, release the grasp. Um, this is one of the more exciting things that we've done recently because typically tactile sensing is done in an open air environment where it's very easy to tell if you're in contact or not and what to care about in your stream of data. But when you plunge your hand into sand or snow or rice, any type of granular media, now you're stimulating everything. So then the, the perception problem becomes about how to um, find the feature of interest that is now buried in all this other distracting tactile noise that's generated, generated by the granular media. So what you'll see in the upper right-hand corner it are two different versions um, of things going on at the fingertip. The top one is actually the torque at the, measured at the base of the finger. The bottom was, is the estimated force on the biotech finger. And what you're going to see is as the finger uh, passes through the granular media, it will flow freely through. And there will be some kind of baseline amount of force on the finger. At, at some point, there will be what's called granular media jamming. And uh, Daniel Goldman, in, in your physics department here on campus, is an expert in granular media. Um, he could probably tell you more about granular media jamming. But my understanding of it is that these granular media particles um, can act like liquid or fluid or something in between, depending on how densely they're packed and the friction uh, characteristics between the particles and so on. But imagine that you're able to just freely move through the granular media the, as, as your finger or intruder pushes through the granular media. Some particles get out of the way. But if you have something buried back here that is stopping the particles from getting out of the way, they start to bump up against one another, forming what's called a force chain. So there will be a, a set of particles that will then, uh, when you're way out here, you're going to feel like you're touching the object, but you're actually feeling forces through this force chain. So we thought this was a liability because when you're trying to do occupancy mapping and create a map of something that you're trying to find that's buried, how do you know that if the object is that big and you're directly contacting the object, or if the object is much smaller, has a different shape, is in a different orientation, and you're just getting tricked by the granular media jamming. Um, but what we've discovered is that you can think of it more like a proximity sensor. So you have a tactile sensor, you put it in the granular media, and now all of a sudden it becomes like a proximity sensor. And if you understand the, the characteristics of the granular media that you're in, then you actually have a more conservative, safe threshold where you can stop the finger back here because you understand the jamming. And then you can um, use your understanding of the granular media characteristics to refine the map of what's buried. So you'll see little white particles that we believe are part of this quote unquote soil failure zone that moves ahead. Think of that as like the you know part of the you know like a lidar or something but in sand and it's moving ahead of the finger and then when it when that failure zone makes contact with the object you'll see uh, a spike in or a, a steady increase in the force on the fingertip. So here's that soil soil failure, failure zone. And it's going to make contact with that buried block way before the, the fingertip. We actually stop the fingertip before there's contact, but you can already see a reflection of that granular media jamming. So we are using this to our advantage and leveraging the fact that granular media turns our tactile sensor into a proximity sensor. And um, I'll just play this little video here. So we're imagining through free movement of the sand, you have the soil ferrozone, but as soon as you come upon something buried, you're going to get jamming. 
And so this was our first foray into this. So the classifier is, is pretty simple. It's basically using all the data we have from the biotech and, and saying, are we freely moving through sand or are we actually in contact um, through jamming with something that's buried? And then you can replay this, combine that with um, Bayesian Hilbert maps and occupancy maps to create this probabilistic map of where you think something is buried. I'm just showing you two uh, exploratory movements, or EMs, here. Um, but uh, Dr. Jia also extended this to uh, select the next exploratory movement, because you can imagine touch is very expensive, and especially if you're interacting potentially with something that's dangerous, you want to minimize touches, you want to minimize um, large forces. So based on the current map, you select the next exploratory movement that would be the most efficient to add um, information that would reduce uncertainty. So this is what it looks like after seven exploratory movements. And of course, it's, it's up to the designer to set the threshold for accuracy and determine when the robot should stop. But here, the robot is doing this semi-autonomously. Maybe you want to send that information um, to a remote human operator, or maybe you want uh, someone to be monitoring multiple robots doing this all at the same time and just kind of check in at a, at a high level. But the point is that you know, maybe this is not directly working with individuals with limb loss, but at least it's an application that might prevent um, new individuals with limb loss. So that's, that's one of the ways that we think about this work. All right, so touch is expensive. You, actually, you can't go online, cannot go online, and just download millions of images um, that you might be able to get through some of these repositories. I think there was a push to create some open source shared repository of touch information. Um, but I think that's a, you know, it's, it's a very ambitious approach, because even with my own robot setup, my tactile sensor, my experimental test bed, throw in some granular media, every trial is different. And then even if a colleague tries to recreate that in their lab, the subtle difference in fingertip movement, maybe it's a slightly deeper um, raking motion, maybe it's a slightly faster uh, motion, all these drastically change the type of information that your tactile sensor encodes. And I'll show that a little bit later. But the point is that touch is expensive. We don't yet have good analytical models for uh, you know, especially the biotech, right? Um, you might be able to model how the finger pad elastomer deforms and the fluid inside, but bridging that finger pad shape to the 19 different electrode readings, I don't know how to do that. And, and I believe that uh, NVIDIA has done this and, and published it, but they modeled the mechanical deformation um, and then bridged that last gap with uh, neural networks. So um, how do we learn to use tactile sensor data when it's so expensive. It costs um, student time. It causes wear on the robot. Um, and it, it just it's very expensive. So we started entering into this uh, reinforcement learning branch of, of things that we were working on. This was our first foray into it. So it's a pretty simplistic reinforcement learning approach. But we were using contextual multi-arm bandits. And in this paper, comparing it to, to Q-learning as a benchmark. But the point is that. Um, you know, we were basically doing a contour following task with a deformable object, like a, a Ziploc bag. We did not have a model of the tackle sensor. We did not have a model of the bag. And by learning through experience, um, we were able to learn a policy for closing the bag. So what you have here is an arm with biotechs. We set up a camera. Um, the camera is basically meant to automate the reward and learning process. But once the policy is learned, you don't actually need vision. You just need touch. And uh, you might wonder, why, why use touch anyways? Isn't it sufficient to just know the direction of the zipper and follow it? Well, here's an example of, um, you know, you could easily visually distinguish the line for the zipper but it's very easy for the finger to slip off the zipper. So you're going to need some you know, step-by-step -step, uh, adjustment of the finger relative to this deformable object. And that's where we believe that, that touch is very important. So we set up a very simple state action reward space. We said, OK, very crudely, let's split the finger pad into different um, 
states, low, center, high, these regions on the fingertip. Let's, you know, if you want to make it all the way across this five inch long or whatever zipper, you probably want to keep the zipper close to the center of the finger pad, otherwise it's going to pop up and fall out of grasp or like the bag itself will fall out of the grasp. So we reward for um, keeping the zipper relative to the, the center of the finger pad. And then uh, this set of actions came about after some preliminary study. We tried more, but this was most efficient. So these are our five different actions. And then we have the robot try each action. Uh, what you'll see up in the upper left-hand corner is what's going on with the impedance electrodes. And then we have this uh, classifier that tells us what region of the finger we're in relative to the zipper, and then a apply a reward or not. And the, the dots on the finger are just to automate this um, state and reward system. But you can see there's a lot going on here with the finger pad deformation that we don't currently have the ability to model. So touch is expensive, but the whole point of this paper is that um, if you are learning while doing, um, that's a more efficient way of using tactile sensor data. And then once you've learned this policy, um, we can apply it to other novel bags and loading conditions. Um, you'll notice that there's this motion planning delay. At the time, we just cared about showing the feasibility of this approach. We had no interest in making it going faster. So um, we're just going to have to deal with that delay in these videos, which is why they're, they're all sped up. But we have. Um, you know, the previous bag was a McMaster car bag, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Now this is a more flexible kitchen type bag when we loaded it in different ways. And um, we tried to apply the same learn policy to wires and cables, but it, it wasn't very success successful. So um, that part did not generalize. Uh, more recently, we have a paper on uh, flipping a notebook page. And again, we were looking for a task where um, touch, especially fine features of touch, are particularly important. And so um, Yi Zhang led this paper. And we, we used a Canova arm. We have two biotech sensors. We have a binder. And uh, the motion capture markers are just there to um, help with the, the automation of the rewards. But um, our reward function is based on the fluid pressure or the fingertip force, the electrode impedance, so what's going on with the finger pad shape, which you, don't, you wouldn't think there's much going on when you're just flipping a page, but I'll show you on the next slide that there is. And then finally, binder movement, where we would penalize if the binder was moved too much. Um, so because we were trying to demonstrate um, one of the first uses of uh, tactile-driven reinforcement learning, we had to come up with some different states or behaviors and pick one that was ideal. So um, our ideal case is a semicircular trajectory. So imagine that you know the um, radius of the, the grass point on the page to the, the binding on the book. And if you wanted to have the smoothest semicircular trajectory, you can, in theory, do that right off the bat. But what if you do not know the particulars about this page? And you just start learning. If you, if you are using too small of a radius, you're actually holding the page too close to the binding, you get some page warping, and then you'll see some snapping at the end. If you attempt a radius that is too large, now you're pulling the binder or lifting it up off the table. And so we called those the, the um, you know, undesirable behavior. So we had to create this uh, artificial ideal, an ideal case to demonstrate this. Um, and so I'll play these videos. I think the most interesting behaviors are if you watch the warping trajectory. So you can visually see the warping, and then you see that snap of the page as the page flips over. Now, for each of these behaviors, you can collect rich tactile sensor data. And this is just showing you four different electrodes telling you about finger pad deformation. You don't have to look into all the details of this, but I wanted to show you that you know, the top finger here in this row experiences something different from the bottom finger. 
I'm sure if you turn the wrist a little bit, it'd be even different from this. So this is going back to my point that uh, tactile sensor data are hard to share across uh, groups because every experiment is so unique. Then within each finger, just looking at different regions of the finger, they experience different things. And then if you pick one finger and one electrode, de depending on that behavior, you get three different behaviors. So that was the key. That's what Yi spent most of his time on, was finding something distinguishable in the tactile sensor data that distinguishes these three states that we care about. And once he did, you can see in these gray regions here, this is where a lot of the snapping happens, and you can see that in these little spikes in the blue. So his reward function is crafted to try and get to these smooth, approximate these smooth green trajectories that we call ideal. And um, once he learned a policy, he then showed in that paper that he could adapt that policy to different contexts. And we used page size as context. So on the top row, you have small pages. On the bottom row, you have large pages. The first column is the very first policy update. And then the, the last column is where we ended. But basically, if, if you don't know the size of the page, um, you're going to learn through touch only what is the appropriate movement for that particular context. All right, I've got two more points about touch. The very brief one is that touch is shareable. So everything I've shown you is really about developing capabilities for robots to do semi-autonomous things, but you can also send the tactile data to a remote operator. So this is me at um, ICRA 2022 trying out this tactile tele-robot that made it to the uh, Avatar XPRIZE finals. And I'm wearing these haptex gloves that use little pneumatic bladders to press against my fingers when the biotechs here are pressing against an object. And it's really difficult to do. You really wish you had vision to do this type of stuff. But the point is, you can take the tactile sensor data and have the robot do something semi-autonomously, or you can send it somewhere else. Uh, so now we come back to a follow-up six years later um, in Dustin Tyler's lab. OK, so we come to the last comment I have to make about touch, which is that touch is connection. I've spent most of my professorial career thinking about touch, but from a very task-oriented uh, perspective. What is the type of touch information you need to put the peg in the hole or close this bag or whatever, but not from the social perspective? And um, through a confluence of, of factors, you know, the pandemic, the fact that we're not you know, no hugs, no handshakes. You know, for a long time, um, there was a real, you know, void created without touch as a means of, of connection with other people. And so that's a, a direction that my lab is heading now. It, and uh, to be clear, affective touch has existed for a long time. It's not brand new. It's just that my lab is just now beginning to get into that. Um, but this idea of um, touch for connections with uh, new little ones, or your loved one, or grandchildren, right? Um, we had the honor of being uh, highlighted amongst many other labs in this uh, cover story at National Geographic on the power of touch. And uh, Cynthia Gorney, who, who wrote the article, and Lynn Johnson, who took the photographs, they made this the cover story, because that, that critical period of bonding between 
the mother and the newborn, if you haven't heard of it yet, um, you know, that direct skin-to-skin -skin contact as soon as the baby's born is, is um, you know, believed to be very important for building these connections. Um, so that's why they picked that for the cover. But there are all these other aspects of touch that are not just task-oriented, is the point. Um, so as part of this, um, UCLA and some other institutions are part of this Human Fusions Institute that Dustin Tyler created at Case Western Reserve University. And if anyone is interested in, in joining, feel free to reach out to me. I'll connect you with Dustin. But um, the point is that we are directly connecting human and robot experiences using what Dustin's team calls neuroreality to enable humans to be physically in one place and experientially in another. And again, this is not a new idea. The idea of teleexistence has existed for decades from Japan. But I think um, what people are thinking about more is not just using a remote robot to perform a task, but actually using a remote robot to have a social connection with someone. Um, really have the, the person feel like they're not using a tool, they're using their own body in this other location. And this thing about neural reality is, um, it's not to say that you actually have to make everything realistic, because you can imagine taking LIDAR information, proximity information, and sending that to someone's nervous system. Right? That could be their new reality through which they, they learn to operate, even though, as far as I know, we don't, we don't have proximity sensors. So here's a robot system. Charlie Kemp to the rescue again. We have uh, one of these uh, stretch robots uh, in our lab as part of a different collaboration. So it, it was readily available for this Avatar X Prize that we entered into. And then in Cleveland, we have an operator system. Again, there are many different approaches that you can use for the robotic system. We purposely went for something that human is human safe is a low profile, easily scalable, because we have visions beyond the Avatar XPRIZE competition. Similarly, for Dustin Tyler's group, um, we're both very interested in healthcare applications. While he does do experiments with peripheral nerve stimulation, we realize that not everyone has that capability or desire to have some um, you know, intrusive um, device like that. So he's also developing wearables. This particular one uses electrotactile stimulation. So it's you know, people always ask, is it, does it feel natural? And the answer is no. But my um, response from my practical, with my practical engineering hat is, is it useful information? So you know, by combining maybe uh, some, some visual, audio, and tactile data, even if the tactile data is not as natural as your own tactile data, but those data are synchronized, and it's useful for performing you know, a handshake or whatever it is that you're doing, um, that, that's good enough for me. So we connected this stretch system in an attempt to create an immersive teleoperation environment. The, the, the goal is something that is seamless, um, full body control. So you know, we, we could have gone with exoskeletons and lots of uh, third person cameras, things like that. We're actually leveraging the built in hand tracking capabilities, which is why the operator is wearing a white glove to help with that visual contrast. Um, but we're going after multimodal feedback. So this was um, our entry. We made it to the semifinals in Florida, which is fine by me. And we got in, we created, we bonded, we created a collaboration, and now we're continuing it um, after this competition is over. So. This is Dustin interacting with a judge. I think one of the most unique things and scary things from our perspective as a competitor is that you do not operate your own robot in the competition. Judges who are experts in the field who've been recruited operate your robot. You have an hour to train them. If it's not intuitive or they don't learn what you've trained them in that hour, that's it. You have to watch for the next hour as things go wrong and you can't do anything about it. So uh, we, this is Dustin during the training period. Uh, and there's a judge here that will take his place, observing how he's interacting. And then there's a judge um, in a different room that is embodying this robot that is learning how to operate the robot as, as uh, Dustin presents different things and shows them, you know, look down at your hand. I'm going to shake your hand. Can you grab this object? And, and so on. You only have an hour for that. And so with this very slim um, robot, we focused on um, vision and touch. 
And we actually uh, strapped a binocular camera on and skipped the Intel RealSense because we weren't trying to develop any semi-autonomous behaviors. We wanted binocular or stereo vision data to go directly into the oculus of the operator. And it's pretty compelling when you're the person interacting with the robot, they look like eyes. So um, one of my favorite moments is, is when my student says, OK, we're about to connect. And then all of a sudden, the robot comes to life. We don't filter out any movements. And it really feels like someone is there. Like, you actually have to think about things like peripersonal space. Because I we had the National Geographic um, writer in Cleveland. And she was visiting me through the robot. And I popped in front of her. And I said, hey, Cynthia. And she got startled. Because she didn't have the wide field of view. She didn't know I was going to do that. Like, there, there are actual social things that we're going to have to think about when people begin embodying these, thing, these robots in, in uh, social situations. Um, we also had this prosthetic hand. Um, they're, they're sensorized. They're probably the, the lowest you know, spatial resolution, cheapest type of sensor you could put on. But that's what we had to work with. The ones in the fingertips were built in. Um, I would love to have more sensors for the palm of the hand, because not everything we do is with fingertips. And so just to even do a handshake, we needed more sensing. So we put additional FSRs on the uh, proximal palmar aspects of the digits. Um, there are some tactile sensors already built into this particular hand in the palm. And then we send that to this operator who's then trained for an hour and then has to perform these different tasks. There was a, a jigsaw puzzle task. There was feeling this vase and reporting on texture. There was picking up a mug and doing a toast. Uh, for the actual finals, they went more aerospace and NASA directed. So you go up and you get you learn a mission from someone. So there's that interaction. Um, and then once you understand your mission, you drive over and you're uh, doing things like using a drill, finding the roughest rock that's supposed to be uh, for fuel, or um, picking up different fuel cells and putting them in uh, different slots. So, um, but the point is that vision and touch um, are all very important for situational awareness. And um, we're looking forward to extending this. We've got uh, some ONR funding coming for the next two years to take our current capabilities, but put them onto ONR relevant hardware, you know, Navy relevant hardware, work on Navy relevant tasks and things like that. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so I thought in the last uh, slide, I would just leave you with some things that I think are um, exciting areas. So if you're looking for a new PhD topic, um, these are things that are unsolved problems, right? So I think that having proximity sensing um, local to the hand is very useful. And so this is from Jacob Siegel's lab. They actually use the same unit to do proximity and tactile sensing. But there's a computer vision-based approach that has also been recently published, where imagine the skin. You can have it on the fingertip. You can also have a whole skin-like sleeve on the forearm. If you control the um, opacity of the skin and you look through the skin with a camera, it's a proximity sensor. If you make the skin opaque, and now you're looking at the deformation of the skin. Now you have a tactile sensor. So I think that's an exciting new direction. Um, sim to real. We'd love to have more ways of modeling tactile sensor and finger object interactions. And that would open, you know, open up um, capabilities for model predictive control, which I know other uh, labs do based on kinematics and computer vision, things like that. But we've kind of been shut out from that so far because we don't have a way to predict what would happen in the tactile sensor um, regime under different contact conditions. Uh, I think there's a new subfield of uh, robotics that's coming up now, which is social physical human robot interaction. Right? There's social human robot interaction. You can think of like ro robots for autism, where there's no contact, but it's a robot that will interact with uh, individuals on that uh, spectrum. Um, there's also physical human robot interaction. Maybe you're collaboratively lifting a table and, and reorienting the table. But then there's social physical interaction. And um, Dr. Alexis Block is a postdoc in my lab. and. Um, she, for her PhD with Dr. Catherine Kuchenbecker, built Huggybot. She built four versions of Huggybot. And this robot is meant to give hugs. And it seems kind of trivial, but if you read her dissertation and her papers, there are so many subtle things. The timing, the force, the responsiveness. Is it, a, is it a height appropriate? All of that. And that's the social 
physical human-robot interaction. And she's very interested in, in uh, extending that. Her research vision involves looking at um, wellness and um, mental health through robotics. And finally, I think um, you know, as, as robot avatars become uh, more common, and they're not just used for uh, things like nuclear decommissioning, right? Um, that they could enable inclusion in our society. So there's a cafe in Tokyo um, where uh, individuals with impairments from their home can log in and embody a robot and um, be the waiter, waitress in, in a cafe, and also interact with people. So I believe that you know, this is also a way to um, enable the full participation in society of, of a lot of our vulnerable populations. So uh, what I don't show here are large area tactile sensing. One of our next projects is to develop tactile sensors for the palm. I would love to have you know, whole body tactile sensing. This is an area that people are interested in. And once you start scaling up the devices for collecting the information, you have to think about how do you do the process, signal processing? And so uh, federal agencies and funding agencies are actually really excited right now about event-based neuromorphic tactile sensing. So you're not monitoring your tactile sensors all the time. You monitor them when something interesting happens, when something spikes. Um, so that's neuromorphic tactile sensing. All right, well, I would not be able to give this talk without my collaborators, funding agencies, all the students that did all the really hard work. And I thank you for your attention. Right, uh, presentation. So we'll have a few minutes for the Q&A. So. Yep. Simple question. I'm not too familiar with tactile sensing. So I was, and I think you mentioned it briefly, but like how many sensors would I have in like, like per square centimeter, per square millimeter? Of a human hand? Yeah, just of yes. a human hand. Yeah, so um, in the literature it says you have about 2,000 mechanotransducers in one fingertip. And so imagine, that, that's why no one is trying to create you yeah. know, these 10,000 uh, taxil type of artificial sensors. And actually, um, I get that question a lot about how many taxils would it take to be like a human fingertip. And I like to turn the question around, which is, what's the minimum number of taxils to encode the information that you need to make your decision? Because even in the page flipping task, we have 19 electrodes. But because my student had to do all this processing and then put it through the RL learning algorithm, um, 19 was too much. So he cut up the, the uh, finger pad into six regions and used PCA because he had too much data. So again, I think it's uh, about the type of data and making sure you get just enough information. You don't need to go overboard and have hundreds of thousands of that's what my Taxing. question was kind of getting at, because I imagine the whole body, you have so many thousands, right? And yep. from a processing perspective, that's a lot. So yes. thank you. Yep. Okay. Any questions for okay, so we have no. So I'm kind of like familiar with uh, vision-based tactile sensors like gel site and kind of like looking into research into that. But mm -hmm. so uh, and you have also like mentioned a lot a lot of different type of tactile sensors. So what do you think, uh, or in your opinion, how the other sensors can, uh, what, what can be the uh, you know, like shortcomings of the gel set tactile sensors, and what are the other sensors that can like? Yes, so there's no one perfect tactile sensor. Yeah. Um, I think that you have an array of, you know, uh, different types to choose from, and all of them have their pros and cons. So for example, you can get really beautiful high spatial resolution from a vision-based tactile sensor, but right now you're limited to about 30 frames per second. So if you care about vibration, maybe that's not the best way to go. Um, there are other complementary sensory types. Throw on an acoustic sensor, or an IMU, or something like that. So it doesn't just have to be the types of tactile sensors that I showed. You can have a suite of sensors. But the point is that there are things beyond just the traditional third-person camera perspective that can give you information to provide situational awareness to the robot or a remote operator. Uh, and just a small follow-up question is that if you want to uh, go in like high high force sensitive tactile sensing in a way like which can detect high forces as well uh, yep. in small areas. So 
what kind of sensors it uses this? Great question. Um, if you think about light touch, the literature suggests that light touch happens on the order of 0.1 newtons. And so a lot of our work uses tactile sensors that can detect that, like the biotech, like the microfluidic skin. But um, now if you want to do something underwater, like the underwater robot I showed, they have to grip up to 200 newtons. So you have to ask yourself, what is the application? Are you really doing light touch haptic exploration deep under sea? Are you grabbing objects and pulling on rope and you know, retrieving things? So again, they're going to have to be sacrifices. You're not going to be able to check all of the boxes. Um, but you know, if you can check enough of the boxes to complete the task, I think that that's what you should be. I mean, with my practical engineer hat, that's, that's what I would like to shoot for. Of course, there's the scientific hat that I wear where I would love to better understand how we could create something artificial that is as beautiful and multimodal and intricate as what's in biology. But um, I think those have to be parallel things that, that our community explores at the same time. Any questions? Oh. Hi, uh, my question was regarding the granular media. Mm -hmm. um, and um, like I, I was wondering if there could be any way to characterize granular media based on textile uh, uh, sensed inputs. And uh, probably there could be, uh, that could be extended to dual phase media as well. And uh, could there be a general model that could do it in the future? Uh, let me show you this. So this 2021 paper showed a variety of different tactile or different granular media types. If you're interested in different uh, particle diameters, you know we're simulating coarse sand all the way to coarse gravel. So that paper is out. I have another student working on a paper um, looking at the jamming properties I within see. them. So I think again. Going back to your application, what are the types of media that you expect? You know, if you're doing a search and rescue robot, might want to do a bunch right. of experiments with snow packed at different, you know, uh, amounts of uh, different densities, for example. Um, would it be possible? Uh, just just as a follow-up question, would it be possible to use uh, uh, probably synthetic data generation techniques in this case? We did go down that path. Um, and then we got lost. Oh, so right. <laughs> there, you, there are modeling ways to model granular media. And we actually looked at what was in the literature for modeling in a manufacturing context, um, granular media that are being processed. And as they come off the conveyor belt, they start to pile and things like that. Yeah. And then we realized, yeah, we don't want to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just modeling rope, for example, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I think we were limited to ball and stick models. And now we have my collaborator or colleague um, has discrete element rod uh, models, discrete element um, thin shell and plate models. And so that's some of the work that um, students are beginning to work on now. Because I used to do models when I was a PhD student. My whole PhD was modeling the human thumb from a robotics perspective. Um, and so it's not that I don't like models. I did them for five and a half years and then came to the conclusion that all models are wrong. And when I tried to transfer my skills from the biomechanics area that I was trained into robotics, all the robotics reviewers said, where are your experiments? And so that's when I realized, OK, got to let's dig into to doing these actual experiments. Model what you can when you can. But a lot of times you need um, tire meets the road type of data to really convince the community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Following up a little bit on that uh, line of thought, uh, a lot of the material that are in robots are really simpler than the human fingers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have solid mechanics, which can relate uh, pressures in, inside that material to the deformation on the outside. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, interest or uh, action to, to use that as a way to recognize what you're grasping? You mean how the... Uh Use that. Can you describe the that again? Well, the that would be the, the pressures inside oh. the, the solid materials. Yes. Um, I don't know that people have measured internal strain like that, but I do know that uh, you know, with newfound interest in soft robotics, a lot of them are pneumatically driven. 
And so researchers are beginning to use that pneumatic line as not only the actuation, but also the sensing. But again, it's, it's a little bit crude. You can tell you're in contact with something, but the, the reason for a change in pressure in the line could happen anywhere along the line. But it's similar to your idea, but not measuring it through a bulk material from the inside. Thank you. Mm -hmm.